Thank you. Uh, well, like, like she said, I'm, I'm Dr. Jose Shanike. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Women's Hospital. Um, and uh, today my goal is to talk to you about shoulder and elbow pain and maybe increase your understanding of, of shoulder and elbow and, and what causes pain and how we treat it. Um, if I'm going too fast, slow me down. If I'm going too quick, or if I'm going too slow, speed me up. Um, and uh, and it's kind of difficult for me to, to know what you know what the different levels of understanding is for shoulder, but I hope this will help you uh, understand it better. So we'll start with shoulder pain. And uh, can you I don't know if you, you can you'll see over here and everything. Okay. Well, the the shoulder is a uh, it's a joint, it's a ball and socket joint that is made of the humerus bone, which is down here, or the arm bone, and it comes together with the, the shoulder blade over here. And they come together at the shoulder joint. Uh, and where they come together, it's uh, our cartilaginous surface. It's a smooth gliding surface that allows for a smooth range of motion. Um, now, right above the shoulder joint, above the, the humeral head over here, is the rotator cuff. This is the, the supraspinatus tendon, which is one of the tendons of the rotator cuff. And right above that is another, another bone here called the acromion. And it's important to remember that the rotator cuff here is kind of sandwiched in between the humeral head and the acromion over here. It's important to understand later when we talk about how shoulder impingement develops and how rotator cuff uh, tendonitis develops. So essentially then you can... Uh, you can get pain in the shoulder arising from, from rotator cuff impingement here, and if it gets worse, you can get a rotator cuff tear. Also, shoulder arthritis, when you lose that smooth glistening surface in the cartilage, you can get shoulder arthritis, and that can be very painful. And you can get fractures in the bones around the shoulder. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about uh, each one of those. So we'll start with, with uh, impingement. Again, uh, this is the shoulder joint. Uh, the ball on the socket over here, the rotator cuff comes and attaches on that bone right there, right above the humeral head. And then there's a bursa right on top of the rotator cuff. What a bursa is, is a, is a fluid-filled sac uh, that, that has a very, very small amount of fluid and is usually found in between the soft tissue structures and the bone in the body. They're found everywhere around the body to provide some some shock absorption kind of kind of thing, and and, uh, and and they can get inflamed too. Um, then right up right above the bursa is the the acromion. So again, this is a person a person's shoulder who has their their shoulder hanging down by their side. Now, when you raise your your arm up, that bone of the humeral head can come up and and abut against the the acromion. And everything in between, the rotator cuff that's in between can get impinged, and the bursa can get impinged in between. And when, when you do that, when people do that uh, regularly, then uh, you can cause irritation of the rotator cuff, and that that can lead to pain of the rotator cuff. Um, you, so usually, what people describe is they describe pain with overhead activity. So. Um, reaching into a cabinet to, to look for something or, or painting, uh, those are common activities that can lead to, to rotator cuff pain. That's what patients usually describe. And so um, how do we treat rotator cuff impingement? Well, we start with the simple things. We, we, we tr try anti-inflammatories. We do a course of physical therapy with an emphasis in avoiding the aggravating activity. And usually we try that for about a month or so. If that doesn't help, then we can try injections that we put a uh, steroid injection right, right uh, on top of the rotator cuff there to, to calm down, down the inflammation from that. That usually, uh, more often than not, will, ha will help relieve the pain. However, sometimes it doesn't help, you know, when we do the, the conservative treatment and, and, well, you continue to do the same activity and continue to aggravate the rotator cuff it can, it can uh, kind of degenerate and, and, uh, and continue to, to get injured, and eventually can, that can lead to a tear. And usually a tear happens from, from overuse or you know, from, um, uh, from a degenerative disease that happens uh, through time. 
Sometimes it can happen from an injury, from, from actual trauma where you fall and cause a rotator cuff tear. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's usually the rotator cuff tears away from the bone. This is the rotator cuff over here. And that's the bone. It tears away from the bone. And the way we suspect it is when the patient keeps coming back and they say, you know, therapy's not helping, I still have pain, then we start thinking there may be something else keeping it from getting better because it, it should get better with, with therapy and conservative treatment. When it doesn't, then we start thinking about a rotator cuff tear. And uh, so we get an MRI and it shows a rotator cuff tear and the, and the rotator cuff won't, won't heal usually on its own. So in those cases, the treatment is actual surgery. And what we do is we do a, a um, shoulder scope. We make very small incisions around the shoulder, put very small instruments, a little camera in there to, to be able to see, and, some, and very small instruments. And we essentially look at the rotator cuff, look at different structures in the shoulder, and determine what needs to be done. Um, if the rotator cuff needs to be repaired, we repair it. And usually um, we'll do this, the procedure is a same day procedure. You go home the same day. And, uh, and then we start a physical therapy program uh, right away, the, usually the next day, to make sure you keep the motion going. Uh, recovery is usually, we consider it three months, uh, uh, is what it takes for the rotator cuff to heal back. So that's about how long it takes for you to recover from, from the surgery. Um, and this is what it looks like when we look in, in the, through the camera, just to show you what, what we see. Uh, we, we see the, we put the little camera in there and we see the, the humeral head here or that, that bone where the rotator cuff inserts. Usually this is the tendon here. Usually it is off the bone, so it's torn off the bone. So what we, what we do is we put those anchors in there with stitches coming out and grabbing onto the rotator cuff to, to lay it down on the bone again and allow it to heal. Now before doing that, we, we actually roughen up a little bit on the bone over here. We kind of scrape it a little bit to create some bleeding so that it's more sticky, so to speak, and allow the rotator cuff to heal back to it. So moving on to sh shoulder arthritis. Um, shoulder arthritis essentially is wear of the cartilage in the joint. Now that's that smooth glistening surface that allows you to have smooth range of motion can degenerate and then you can end up with a more rough looking cartilage. Um, in the shoulder, arthritis is actually very uh, relatively uncommon in the, in the shoulder. If you think about it, the shoulder is, is not a weight-bearing joint like the knee. In the knee, uh, arthritis develops much more frequently because you're always putting weight on your knee, putting stress on your knee. With the shoulder, the general population really doesn't put it, they, they put some stress on their joint, on their shoulder, but not as much as, as their knee. The exception would be a construction worker or people that, that really work heavily with their upper extremities arthritis can be more common in that population. And <clears throat> what kind of symptoms do they get? Well, they get, you know, pain and decreased motion. You could imagine how two rough surfaces moving together have a harder time uh, moving, so there's decreased range of motion. And usually patients also get a feeling of grinding and, 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 uh, and catching in the joint. Um, the way we treat it is, kind of, is, is we start the same way, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, when that doesn't help, we can try injections. There's no way to really cure, so to speak, arthritis and reverse it back to, to normal cartilage. It's usually a progressive disease. So when those things stop helping, then we a lot of times have to go in there and replace the shoulder, put a new shoulder in. We put a, a metal stem down the arm with a metal ball and then a plastic socket and that becomes a new shoulder. And usually, usually that's very effective in relieving the pain from shoulder arthritis. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it depends what you ask, but uh, you know, the studies that have been, have been done have shown that it, they can, they help about 50% of the people and they may not help the other 50%. So if, if you're an optimist, you take it. If you're a pessimist, uh, but but uh, I I advocate it because in my mind, if you can avoid surgery, you, you, we were trying to avoid surgery. So so, if you can avoid surgery, anything anything would be good. So it's, and it doesn't it doesn't really there's there hasn't been any evidence that it can harm you. There's not not many side effects to it. So in my mind, there's nothing there's nothing to lose. You can it's something to try.
you know, and if it helps you, then even better. If it doesn't help you, then we have other things we can do. So, so you recommend not using it really as a preventative, but just using it to um, Because I think well, you recommend taking it long term. Yeah, yeah usually the, the way, you know, where, we, where I trained, we used it for everyone. We, you know, we did, we did use it um, when they had arthritis. I, I've never heard of it being used for prevention. Uh, and I don't know if there's any studies out there uh, that, that show that it can prevent arthritis. But, um, you know, it also hasn't been shown that it ca causes any, any damage. So, so even though I don't have the evidence that, that it can prevent arthritis, um, I, I think it, w it wouldn't hurt. Because if we're thinking that it, it, it may reduce or better, make it better when you do have arthritis, it makes sense that it may, may, de may prevent arthritis too. Uh, but I, I don't have the evidence, the hard evidence to, to show that. You know. um, the other problem that can cause pain is a fracture around the, sh around the shoulder, and those, those are usually very easy to, to diagnose because the patient will come in and say they, f they had a fall and now the shoulder hurts a lot. You get an x-ray and it looks something like that. I mean, that's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Other times it may not be as, as, as uh, visible, like here. There's a fracture there. You can't really see it that, that well. But uh, in the shoulder, fractures that happen in the shoulder, 95 or more of them can be treated appropriately with, with no surgery, with uh, conservative treatment, putting uh, a sling or a sling and swath uh, uh, is usually enough to heal a fracture in the shoulder um, because, the, because the bones oppose together very well that way. Now, when, when we're not able to, to bring the bones together, uh, appropriately um, um, after a fracture, then sometimes you do need to do surgery, and this and this is what we do: put the bone kind of together. There's a fracture there; is is difficult to see because the bone is kind of keyed in uh, after it's been put together, and uh, then we put a plate with screws to fix a fracture in that way. What's that? Okay. Well, the same thing. Uh, you know. It depends. It de this is this is the upper arm over here. You would say. Uh, yeah. So so, I don't know exactly where you had yours, but maybe maybe somewhere right here. Yeah. But yeah, really, a lot of fractures in the whole arm. They heal. They heal pretty pretty well with with no surgery. Um, and did you have surgery? Yeah. So so, so so um, you know, in some some cases we do have to do surgery, but it's it's the minority of the cases. Usually it takes about four to six weeks to to heal a fracture. They, st they stay in there forever unless they cause you pain or if they get infected, things like that, then we take them out. They may set off alarms in the airport. <laughs> yeah. Before you get to elbows, mm -hmm. what about a frozen shoulder? I, I had that. Is there any way to prevent that? I don't, I don't think there's any... You did? Okay. Well, I don't, I don't think there's a way to prevent it. And a lot of times... Okay. Okay. A frozen shoulder is a is a is an idiopathic disease. Something um, for the most part, where we don't know exactly how it happens in in most cases, but it's it's where the patient will feel like their shoulder becomes stiff and painful, and and for no apparent reason, and it's it's very difficult to move the the shoulder, and and uh, you know and and it's something that that uh, that itself you know it, it it resolves on its own a lot a lot, a lot of times with physical therapy you know uh, aggressive physical therapy to kind of get the, the shoulder moving again and then usually it goes away and, and patients fine again uh, but we you know a lot of times we don't know where where it came from how it happened now we, we do know diabetics are more propensed to getting shoulder uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder which is the same thing um, but that's what it is you know and, and it's a usually it resolves although sometimes it's it's it it persists for a long time, and and in some cases it doesn't resolve. So. We you know we can go. I'll go back and show you. I I think it, I might have a picture to show it, um, but I'll I'll show it when once once we're done. Okay, I'll go back. Um, You know, 
there are sometimes, you know, every time you go have to go do, take hardware out there, you know, if, they, if it's there for a long, long time, a lot of times bone can form over the screw head. So, so to get to the screw with the screwdriver, you have to kind of take take the bone, that bone, kind of take it away, you know, kind of. So yeah, there's sometimes where where it can be a little more more difficult, especially the longer time, you, the long the longer the plate is in there. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, but, but usually it's pretty, usually you, you, you go in there, put a, you know, it's, it's, you take the screw out, take the plate out, and usually it goes pretty well. It's not a very complicated procedure. Uh, so is there like, so you don't think there's like a certain time span, like to say, well, like after maybe five years or so? Like no, no, no. We've, we've taken out hardware that's been there for a long time, you know, where a little kid had a fracture when they were, when, when they were young, and then they come in as an adult. And for some reason, it gets infected or something happens, and we still take it out. So yeah, um, but but for the most part, they stay in. They don't cause any problems, no pain, and no infection. Because it looks like the screw was actually going beyond the, the other side of the bone. Yeah. I didn't know if it was like hitting soft tissue. Or right, right. It's it's you know, usually we usually different surgeons are different. Some surgeons say you know they want to really grab that bone, so it, if it sticks out a little bit, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, um, uh, but usually if, if it's less than about two millimeters beyond the bone, it's usually not a problem uh, because there's, what you can see on the x-ray is, is the bone, the actual bone, but there's periosteum and things around the bone that are also very hard that you don't see on the x-ray. So the screw is probably not impinging against anything. It's, it's probably within a, a tissue that is not going to harm anything, but you can't see it on the x-ray, so it looks like it's flying, the, you know, it's like it's not touching anything. Sure. Um, so elbow pain. The, the elbow joint is a uh, is a joint. Uh, it's a hinge joint made of the arm bone of over here, over here, or the humerus, and the ulna, or the forearm bone down here. There's a, there's also a little bit of uh, you know the rad the radius and the humerus that form part of the elbow joint, but in simplistic ways, it's a hinge joint made by those by those two bones. Now, this is just looking at the bone over here. In reality, we know there's muscle, nerve, soft tissues around the elbow, ligaments that, that can be a source of pain as well. So we can, we can get pain then from, from the actual joint where the cartilage is. Again, you can roughen up the cartilage and get elbow arthritis. You can uh, uh, irritate the tendons around the elbow, uh, something called... Yeah, yeah, something called tennis elbow or lateral or epicondylitis. It's the same thing. Um, then you can also get irritation and compression of the nerve that goes around the elbow, and that can also be a source of pain. The other thing that can cause pain in the elbow sometimes is uh, uh, happening uh, referred from somewhere else. Like if you get, for example, a disc herniation in the neck, and it pinches on a nerve that goes to the elbow, then you may feel the pain in the elbow and not in the neck. And that's kind of tricky sometimes to, to realize that. Um, so starting with tennis elbow, um, the, another term for it is lateral epicondylitis. Now what, what is lateral epicondylitis? Is inflammation of the lateral epicondyle. And the lateral epicondyle is essentially a a prominence in the outside of the elbow, and actually, if you if you take your right hand and you bring it over and grab your your opposite rib cage, and then you you grab onto your elbow, your thumb should feel, should fall on almost on the lateral epicondyle, and it is that most prominent spot in the outside of the elbow. And what happens is, out of that bony prominence, originate a, gr a group of muscles that allow you to extend your wrist as if stopping someone or stopping a moving vehicle, things like that. And, and the muscles go and the, uh, through the, uh, you know, they, they travel on the back of your forearm and they go and insert in the wrist to allow you to do that. So what happens is, um, and this is another picture of it to show you how, how lateral epicondylitis happens or how tennis elbow happens. Again, that lateral epicondyle is right there the muscle coming in the back of your forearm and inserting the wrist. And when, you, when that muscle tightens, you can see that the, uh, it brings the wrist up. And so at the same time, though, that it pulls on the wrist, it also pulls on the, 
on where it or originates. So doing that motion repetitively can cause inflammation in the lateral epicondyle. Very common in tennis players where they do the backhand. That's why they, that's why they call it t uh, tennis elbow. But it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a tennis player to get it. There's a lot of activities that involve excess, extending the wrist that, that may not be, uh, may not, may not uh, be um, obvious. For example, if you're vacuum cleaning or, or, or grabbing onto a grocery bag, for example, if you, know, if you think about it, if you try to, to, to grip something with your wrist flexed, it's really almost impossible. So grip, the gripping motion inherently includes wrist, wrist extension. And so gripping, a lot of gripping motion will also, uh, may also lead to tennis elbow. Um, so um, how do we, so how, and, and, so how do we diagnose it? Well, you come to my office and what I'll do is I'll start <laughs> pressing around the elbow and uh, usually there's a lot of tenderness right there where the, where the lateral epicondyle is. Also, we will ask you to extend your wrist and then I'll try to, to break it, you know, and you keep it there strong and, and that stress will put, will put a lot of traction on the lateral epicondyle and, and, and cause pain in the lateral epicondyle and that's how, you, how we diagnose it. So how do we treat it? Again, um, a common theme in orthopedic surgery and orthopedics is that not, about 95% of the problems in orthopedics can be treated appropriately with non-operative treatment, okay? Uh, so, so you're going to hear me say this over and over, uh, but, but essentially the treatment in, uh, for tennis elbow is we do physical therapy. Um, we're now using some compound creams that are creams uh, that are mixtures of different kinds of creams made by specialty pharmacies that we put on the, on the area of, of inflammation and they are supposed to penetrate through the skin and go and relieve the inflammation. And those are, I found that are very effective as well. Um, we can use braces, special type of brace that presses on the, on the uh, extensor tendons that I was talking about. And they, they are helpful for some patients, not that helpful for others, but it's something to try. Um, and then we can put injections right there uh, in the area of inflammation. Um, those are usually pretty effective. Again, 95% of this, res of the tennis elbow resolves conservatively. 5% or less of patients uh, uh, will require surgery to, to deal with the problem, but we, we really can't avoid it. I think 95 is a, is a, is a low number. Really more like 99% of patients get better. Not usually, but that's another problem we're going to talk about in a second, okay? <laughs> and this is this is leads us to, to right here, okay? So there's also the nerve nerves that start at the neck and go to the elbow. In particular, there's one or to the hand. In particular, there's one called the ulnar nerve, and that's a nerve that starts in the neck, goes all the way, passes through the inside of your of your elbow, and then goes all the way and and provides sensation to the small and and half of the ring finger, okay? But while it, while it goes to the elbow, it, as, as it passes through the elbow, it goes through something called the cubital tunnel, which is a, a tight tunnel made of bone. And, uh, and also uh, there's a little band on top of it that kind of makes it really tight for the nerve to be there. This nerve is actually the one responsible for the funny bone feeling. When you hit your elbow, you're actually hitting uh, the ulnar nerve. And um, so... When the arm is extended out, the nerve is relaxed, okay? When it's flexed, the nerve is under more tension. So what kind of things can lead to, and, and what symptoms the patients get is they, once the nerve gets compressed, they get tingling and numbness, they get pain, the, pain in the elbow, as well as tingling and numbness going down to those ring and small finger. And how does it happen? Well, things, talking on the phone, we'll do it, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of times sleeping with the elbows bent. So that's, this is the most common cause of it, where you pe people sleep with their elbows bent. And it's a terrible habit to break because we've been doing it since we're very young. Like this. <laughs> so, um, so it's very, it's, so, so how, do we, how do we diagnose it? Well, you come to my office, we'll tap, tap on the nerve and, and uh, kind of tap on that area right there. And usually that's, 
area is very sensitive and the pain will shoot down the patient's uh, fingers. Um, and, uh, and then, and then we, we go further and get another study called the nerve conduction study to confirm the diagnosis, kind of tell where the problem is. Um, how do we treat it? Well, the idea is we want to keep the, keep the patient from flexing their elbow too much. So usually we'll use braces to, uh, to sleep in so that you can keep your arm straight. You can, you can spend money on a brace like, fancy brace like this, probably pretty expensive. If you want to do more of a, of a home remedy, you can, you can wrap a, a, a towel. We actually, do, you know, we actually do this. Wrap a towel around your elbow, put some tape on it, and that'll keep you from also from, from flexing your, your elbow. Yeah. Um, if, if it doesn't get better, then we do, we do do surgery, and we and, and, uh, usually go in and kind of open up that space for the nerve and give the, the nerve a little more, more space to, 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 to move around when you're, when you're using your arm, and that's usually a very effective surgery. It, it, it does, it's the tangling is there, but yeah, you, yeah. It, it, the test is not is not a perfect test. A lot of times it does confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes the test may be normal, and uh, and you, but you still have the problem. So a lot, so sometimes we do we just say you know what the test is normal, but the pain has not gotten better and it's still bothering, and a lot of times you still go end up end up doing the surgery. And uh, yeah, I've, I've seen cases where yeah, where if, essentially the, the symptoms were there, the, the the clinical picture was there, but the test was negative, so and we ended up you know doing the surgery, and the patient got a lot better. You know, the yeah. negative test means that the nerve is still there. We just need to untense it. Pretty much, and also remember this this happens a lot of times when you're flexing your elbow. So when you go get if you if you get the test, and the, and right before getting the test, you've been good to your elbow, not flexing it too much, et cetera, the nerve, the nerve might, be, might be fine when you get the test. So that can, that can lead to what we call you know, the, a, a, false, a, false, uh, a false negative. Yeah. How would you that from the nervous system What's that? A surgical disc can cause, how would you explain that? We'll go to that in a second, too. We'll, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. That, you're asking good questions. <laughs> Okay, but before, yes. Acupuncture is actually, um, um, like you asked before, with the chondroitin sulfate, is another thing that if we can avoid surgery, I'm I'm all for it. You know, I, I'm I'm I advocate acupuncture or really whatever. Cause there's a lot of treatments out there, and. And a lot of patients will get better. I'm not sure I can tell you why or uh, scientifically how they get better. But a lot of patients will come back, you know, nothing helped. I tried acupuncture, and now I'm, now I'm fine. I'm, now I'm better. So insurance won't pay for it. Well, that's true. They won't pay. They, maybe they should if it helps yes. them. You know. But, um, yeah, so, so I'm, all, I'm, I'm all for it. Now, in the elbow right where the nerve is, I don't know, I don't know if I would advocate in that area because I don't, want, I don't like putting needles in where the, where the nerve is. Um, but, you know, but that's, that's, that's me, you know, I, 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 um, it doesn't make, it wouldn't make sense to me to put needles in the, around the nerve, but other areas for other things, absolutely. Um, olecranon bursitis, this is what it looks like, you know, it's, it's, uh, like we said, there's bursas all around the body, there's one bursa right there at the bony tip of your, of your elbow, um, that can get swollen, and, and uh, the way it happens is direct injury or bumping or injuring your, your, the bony tip of, of your elbow. Um, you know, also people that work in a desk and they are rubbing their, their elbows against the desk and bumping all the time, they can get olecranobursitis. And what it is, again, there's a bursa, a little bag of, of, uh, with a very, very small amount of fluid uh, that is that is in between the skin and the and the bone and the elbow, um, and it's usually almost empty. However, when you bump it, it can get swollen, and so it looks, you know, it looks like like an, it has like an egg appearance to the to the bony tip of your elbow. Um, it's usually not painful, and how do, how do we treat it? 
it, the, the way we treat it depends on whether it's infected or not. So if, if it's not infected, it's, it is painless. It doesn't hurt. So it's just some swelling, but it can be very aggravating. So, so we, can, we can do nothing. We can say, you know, just 90% of them will, will go away on their own. So we say we, we, can, we can leave it alone and see if it gets better. If it doesn't get better and it causes a lot of discomfort, we can aspirate it. We can put a needle in there and take the fluid out. And, and that, that also can take care of the problem. If it keeps coming back, because a lot of times it does keep coming back, then that's the aspiration. Then we, we take it out with, uh, with surgery. We take the, the actual little bursa or bag, we take it out, and that usually takes care of the problem then. Sometimes you do get, you do get an infection, and the way we tell an infection is because it looks red, it feels warm, and it's painful. The other one is not painful. This one is painful. In those cases, we do go in there and, and do surgery right away because we don't want it to affect, to make the patient sick. When there's an infection, it can make the patient sick. So we take the, we, we're more aggressive with these kind of, of uh, bursitis. Elbow arthritis, again, smooth glistening surface, rough surface. And it, again, it's not a weight-bearing joint, so it's very uncommon in the general population, more common in people that do uh, um, uh, construction work and overhead, uh, you know, and, and heavy, heavy work with their arms. And uh, again, loss of motion and pain. It's, we treat it. You, get, you guessed it, <laughs> and inflammatory physical therapy, injections initially. When that doesn't help, sometimes we do try arthroscopy, where we um, we'll look inside the joint. This is showing, just to show you how a normal joint looks like, very smooth. Um, uh, and over here, showing you someone with arthritis, where the, arth uh, the cartilage looks uh, a little uglier, and over here, loss of cartilage down to bone. So this is pretty severe arthritis. Usually with a scope, we kind of try to smooth out the joint and clean out the arthritis. There's no way to really bring the, the cartilage back. But it may buy you some time, because if, when it doesn't get better, then sometimes we end up doing a, an elbow replacement. And finally here, talking about uh, referred pain, uh, you can get elbow. Again, if you get a pinched, a pinched nerve over here, you can feel it in the elbow. And how do we, going back to your question, how do we make the diagnosis between elbow pain coming from the elbow or coming from the neck? Well, you, when it's coming from the neck, you may get other symptoms like numbness and, and tingling, um, which are indicative of some sort of nerve pain. Also, you may have pain in other places besides the elbow, like the wrist or hand, which are all the, which are all the places where the nerve actually goes. You may have no tenderness at the elbow, so you may be trying to find, you know, my elbow hurts, but I can't find a spot that hurts or that is tender. Then that may be indicative that the problem is actually somewhere else. Or, you know, if you come in, and sometimes patients come in and say, you know, I, I move my, my neck a certain way and I feel it in my elbow, then that's an indication. But, but if there's a question, essentially we get an MRI and we look at the, at the actual nerve. What is a, a stenosis? Stenosis is, you know, we, we talked about a disc herniation pinching on the nerve. Mm -hmm. You could also get arthritis in the neck that, that crowds the little, little spaces in the nerve, the, where the nerves come out, or in the neck when the ner nerves come out, and that can also constrict on the nerve. And so again, we treated anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, and injections. And if it doesn't help, then we do surgery. So these That's it. Be in the neck. Yes, and they do it on, on their, with x-ray. Uh, we do it with x-ray, we put it right there where the nerve is. So I, 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 we already have a question, your, your question, so uh, let me see if I can go, go back here. And you were asking about the, about the AC joints. It could, yeah, it okay. can, absolutely. So the, yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. That. It can sometimes. And I never knew about the bursa because I've had bursitis. Well, now you know, yeah, it's, it's, know. it's a real problem, absolutely. And in my heel, which I never dreamed of before. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Okay, so here's the shoulder, okay? So we talked about the, the shoulder joint, which is right here. The AC joint is right here. AC joint is another name for, is a chromioclavicular joint. 
is, is where the acromion over here joins the clavicle over here. What's that? Yeah, yeah, it's up, it's kind of up, up here, kind of to, towards the front there. If you trace your clavicle, you, you can feel your clavicle, right? So if you trace it out, you feel a little bump there. That's where that's where the AC joint is, and it can get it can get uh, arthritic, and it can cause pain. Usually, it causes pain, uh, and uh, you know there's treatments we can do for it as well. Sometimes we put injections in there, and other times we if, if it's a long-term problem and it's aggravating, we do a procedure too where we we resect the distal part of the clavicle and kind of open that space up. And that usually is pretty effective in relieving that pain. Exactly. That's, that goes first. Different people think about it differently. Steroid injections, the steroid injections can lead, have been shown to lead to some, accelerate the degeneration in the, in the joint. So it's so 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 it's a catch-22. You know, you, you give too many injections, you can cause degeneration. So uh, so yeah, we the, and and it depends who you talk to. I I usually say I don't I don't like to give injections um, uh, more than than every three months. You know, so three months apart, um, and and you know and and probably not more than three injections a year, because it can lead to inflammation. Um, now you you could argue you know if someone has has really bad bad arthritis and they're getting close to getting surgery, the car, the, the the damage is is already there and so an injection may be arguable to prevent to to make it feel better even though you may cause a little bit of degeneration. I had a chiropractor do and got rid of the bursitis in my shoulder. If for an injection. Well, oh, a chiropractor, okay, yeah. but by doing uh, therapy and things like that. Absolutely, and you know, and a lot of times it'll get uh, bursitis. He's asking about bursitis. A lot of times bursitis will get better on its own oh, okay. and with physical therapy and things like that. 